I, I, I snuck this in. <laughs> Renegade. <laughs> always you, everything. Okay. Um, well, great. I actually know that, uh, I think Emily Plumpton was actually uh, influenced by your work as well when she just was doing Project Age. I think she talked a lot about your work and how that inspired her. Yeah, I actually met her at Comedy's Father. Really? For the first okay. time. Yeah. <laughs> Which this one? is my third time I'm not speaking here. So oh, that's great. great. Yeah. That's great. Well, we love your work, and I wanted to ask about what is it about how we approach problem solving um, that needs to change? I mean, if you were going to talk to a group like this and kind of how you've done this already, um, how would you tell other people to do? Yeah, so uh, the basic way I talk about this is that you know, we live in this profound time. I don't know if we're at the tipping point, but we're close to it, right? So climate change, deep oil, deforestation, population growth, water issues, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so what that means is that the status quo is unacceptable. We just can't keep doing things the way we're doing them. So how do you do that, right? How do you change the way we do stuff? And so Project M was really designed specifically to influence how young creative people address that. And the, the core, like the engine of Project M is called Thinking Wrong. Um, and there was a slide earlier uh, that sort of represents that. And it's, it's based on this kind of the human brain function, how we, we follow these synaptic pathways, right? So our brains are like this, this super highway of these pathways. And you know, me talking right now, I don't have to think about it, right? I have a thought and a vocal. They're, they're very efficient. So when we solve problems, normally we just you know, automatically follow those super highways and go to that file folder of known solutions, right? So um, I've, through Project M the last 10 years, I've really been trying to sort of uh, disrupt the normal way of thinking about things and make stuff and then actually do it, right? So it's, it's very action-oriented and not just kind of conceptual. Uh, I, I believe it was when we were talking on the phone a, a couple months ago, um, you had mentioned something about being not particularly comfortable with the term design thinking, and you reacted fairly strongly against <laughs> it. And it's, <laughs> and it's, yeah, you know, that, it's sort of de rigueur. We hear about it all the time. What's the source of that discomfort? Oh, I, don't, I don't remember okay. that, but um, I think it was probably, I have my own version yeah. of that, right? We call rapid ingenuity. And so the, maybe I was talking about just the term design thinking just sounds like you're sitting around thinking about stuff rather than doing it. I think that's probably what it was all about. Um, and the rapid ingenuity process in, incorporates thinking wrong, but it also incorporates something I think is really important we call small bets. So a lot of times when we're working with organizations or people, they get stuck. You know, they can conceive great ideas, they prototype stuff, and then it, it grinds to a halt um, because you know they're afraid of failure or looking stupid or losing money. And so what we do in in our process is really reduce things to a portfolio of small bets that are affordable losses. What can you do on Monday for fifty dollars? And as, as soon as you sort of um, kind of frame it that way of small, yeah, sure, why, why wouldn't I do small bets? And out of that, um, we've seen things can start to get momentum. And even if they fail, you learn. What did I learn by that? I didn't risk that much. I learned something. And now, you know, it, it just gets the whole ball rolling. It sounds sort of like small-scale venture capital, right? Like you're, you're going to place a lot of bets. You can't tell at the beginning, at that point, which ones are going to... Right win and, and you accept that they're losing losses. Right, and a lot of these, what these slides are, are um, pictures from the project demo over the past 10 years. And a lot of those um, started as this kind of random small bet. Um, probably the most well-known is called Pi Lab. Yeah. 
that started as one thing and then kind of grew out of that. How could you go on with pot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could you take us through one of your, your projects? Because I think it's really exciting when you start walking it through and we get to see how it really develops. It's just fascinating. Yeah, so uh, PyLab is a really good example. We do um, something at the beginning of um, when we gather a, young, a group of young people together. I go around and everyone has to reveal a hidden talent. So, you know, I can juggle flaming clubs or I was a tennis champion. And at the Pie Lab group, one of the girls was really into pie. And I was like, that's not a talent. You know, that's not, that, that doesn't count. But the group grabbed onto it, and they thought it was really interesting. And they, they, this is right after the financial collapse in 2008. And so they threw this event in this little town in Maine called Free Pie. right? And it was actually 3.14. It was March 14th. Um, and it was a huge success, right? I thought it was stupid, but... Mathematicians <laughs> came out from all over. <laughs> no, the, the town came out, the newspapers covered it, TV stations, and so they realized that there was something valuable about gathering community together to um, have conversations and how pie and coffee sort of lubricated that conversation. So the group decided, you know, let's do a pop-up Pi event, and they called it Pi Lab. And I think part of the, the success of it was really they, they branded it. So it wasn't like the um, Greensboro Pie Shop, right? It was Pi Lab. And it's, that's one of the things I've seen at Project M. A lot of these ventures are more successful because they are designers, and they can make stuff real out of nothing. So this group went down to this little town in Alabama, Greensboro, Alabama, one of the poorest counties in America, and did a pop-up pie lab for $600. They took over half of our studio space and built tables and pie boxes and opened up for summer. That was a big success, and they put up a Kickstarter site, got $8,000, um, and we took over a storefront on the main street in this town and they totally renovated it. It was beautiful. We came in second in the James Beard Awards for restaurant design. Um, we lost to the Guggenheim restaurant. <laughs> right. But what I love, and now it's, it's uh, fully functioning. It's run by a nonprofit called Hero. Um, it's a community center. They have open mic nights and ballroom dancing lessons and business incubation classes. Um, so what I like about that story is that how this thing that started kind of in a random place with this interest in pie, we placed a small bet free, you know, free pie, then it was the pop-up pie lab, then it was the big pie lab, and then, you know, it's written up in the New York Times. So um, that's a great example. It is a great example. I think yeah. that's what, the reason why I wanted you to walk through is that it gets me so excited about it. And I think that everybody here in the audience would say, that doesn't sound like something you couldn't do yourself. You know, so I just love that all your projects that you do like that, it's just, it's a scale that could grow and could have significance, but it starts in a place that almost each one of us can do. I think that's a really important part of the story. Yeah, uh, the, the Project M is really designed to give young people this experience, mm -hmm. right, of, of being in a place, connecting with community, using their skill sets, you know, in a positive way. And I, I kind of think of it as this retrovirus, like herpes, you know, <laughs> where you infect them, and then later on in their career, it'll come out. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really more about the process and the experience than it I, is. I, I can see the tweets right now. Oh, yes. Don yes. wants to give everyone her. <laughs> um, Everything that you do, on, at least under Project M, is, is sort of outside of organizations. You subvert, you go right to communities, and you do these amazing yeah. interventions, these, yeah. these sort of things. Is there something inherently dysfunctional about organizations? Why can't organizations be doing this? <laughs> um, there are a couple things I, that come to mind. Um, to start, yes, we. the way it works is we go to a community, um, usually someplace foreign, and it's usually suffering from some degree of, of dysfunction. So East Baltimore, Detroit, rural Alabama, 
um, Iceland after the financial collapse, um, Costa Rica rainforest, right? Um, and I think it's useful for people to get out of their comfort zone, out of their normal environment. But the way it works to address your, con your question is that we never are a service bureau for an organization, right? Because what that sets up is this sort of client-vendor relationship. We always go in with a partner, it's a nonprofit or school or an organization, but we say we're going to do something authentic that has value and we're going to give it to you as a gift. And what this does is it, it kind of creates this dynamic of partnership rather than I'm a client and you are designers and we need a website, right? The other thing it does is I let the group decide 100% of what they're going to do. So, you know, we, we, there's no way to um, uh, ensure a predictable outcome, right? So if we were going, you know, to rural Alabama and we said, you know, we're going to make a pie lab, they'd think we're nuts, right? So I want that freedom to really explore and, and let the, the participants really um, do something that speaks to their heart. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about this because um, there's a lot of. I'm, I'm on an advisory board for a company, a nonprofit, who all their funding comes in the, uh, from like you know some of these other big organizations, and so they can't just walk in like you are doing and say, "No, we're autonomous. We have." what we want to do the way we want to do it. And what i found is the most successful things, even around the world, whether it's in the United States or internationally, have this autonomy where they're just doing the collaboration. And uh, I always say, um, I think you're really doing this. It's, it's, it's uh, something I always say is that we're no longer building companies or organizations anymore, but we're, we're building containers of collaboration. And you do that all the time. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Um... I guess the, a lot of what we're doing, we're trying to orbit the hairball. So the larger the organization gets, you know, the more likely it is to have sort of entrenched frameworks and systems, right, that, that almost guarantee a predictable outcome, right? So, you know, I used the brain metaphor before about these these highways, you know, these ways of doing things that we're trying to disrupt. We're trying to do the same thing for organizations um, and sort of, you know, orbit outside of them rather than get sucked in. And I find that that's where the innovation comes from, right? It, 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 and I don't know how um, you know, a lot of these projects that we're looking at aren't going to change the world, right? So. There's a scalability issue, and you know, like um, earlier, Paul Pollock was, you know, what he's doing is really important. I'm just trying to like set that sort of seed in people, right? So I think working within organizations and systems is valuable. It's just not what I'm doing. Well, except that you do start organizations. You've got Hero. You've got Common. Could you tell us a little bit about both of those, and and how do you keep them from becoming these? Predictable containers yeah. that so yeah that the need common, to be subverted. Hero existed before, so that was a nonprofit we we partner with. Um, but Common, um, that's an interesting story. About two years ago, I had a friend who um, we had lunch, and he asked me, "Have you ever met this guy Alex Boguski?" And Alex is a famous ad guy. If you don't know, his um, he was like creative director of the decade ad agency of the decade, the Crispin Porter Bukowski, and he had re recently quit advertising. Um, and there's a whole story around that that I won't tell right now. But so we got together and I, he, he, you know, he was kind of thinking about the same things from the advertising perspective as I was doing for design. And I describe it as like two pitchforks, you know, resonating at the same frequency, you know, from different places. And so we start thinking about how you could leverage capitalism to drive positive change. So instead of saying capitalism bad, just acknowledge that it is probably the driver of what's happening in the world, right? So the corporations have amassed the wealth and power. Um, and so how can you use that? 
And so we had this idea that if you embedded capitalism with some core values, simple things like you know, sustainability, transparency, collaboration, and community, you know, at the center instead of just shareholder value. Um, and then created a global brand that was shared. So Common was um, conceived of as a global brand that anybody could use who adhered to those basic values. So the way I think about it is like Virgin exists over, over 300 different kind of business categories. So the common can be common taco, common software, common airlines, it doesn't matter. Um, but it's open source and collaborative. So that was the idea with, with And how, if someone wanted to do a common taco or a common whatever, is there a set of criteria that they have to meet? Or like, how does... How there does will be. Okay. What we've, because it's fairly new, what we've been doing are running these events called Common Pitch, where social entrepreneurs apply. We select about a dozen of them, and they pitch on stage, and there are judges. It's kind of like American Idol. And three of those um, projects get pushed forward into the common system. So we've done them in Boulder, Brooklyn, Milwaukee, Cape Town, Patagonia. So that's kind of what we're focused and on. And you just right did now. you just did one, right? Wasn't there one recently? I just in heard Chile yeah. was the last one, I think. And and why not Alabama, Mississippi, or the sure. on the list? Okay. Yeah, but, yeah. but you don't see any any structural difference in doing one in Bogota and doing one in Philadelphia and doing one in Mississippi. So. No, no. The, they could, yeah, the more the better. We only have so much bandwidth to produce these things, but the idea is that it really does expand and takes off on its own. Yes. And, and it, it's a small bet, really. You know, we don't have a business plan, really. We just, a bunch of us got together and said, hey, let's do this. Oh, well, if and we're want, trying. If you want a business plan, <laughs> I've got some students that might be able to help you. Uh, what about you know when we talked on the phone? We, we we talked a little bit about the thirty the thirty percent, and this goes to you know in the U.S. the thirty percent, but in the rest of the world, sort of the ninety percent. A third of the population in the United States is at the poverty line or one paycheck away. From the poverty line. That's that's sort of where we're at. It's 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 incredibly embarrassing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and and the things that you've done under Project M really are firmly rooted in serving these people that are not in design briefs. Nobody's creating solutions for these people. Um, and we don't even have the you know we did a project at uh, California College of the Arts in combination with San Francisco City and. We had a whole, eve, a whole uh, two-day charrette around what kinds of solutions can you build to scale to serve these people who are essentially just ignored from, you know, media technology. These people don't have cell phones or smartphones, rather. Um, and one of the hardest things we found was we we don't know them. We don't we don't live with them. We don't. They're not the people that our clients hire us to do design research for and build personas. We didn't even have the fundamental. Uh, ground, groundbreaking or a ground, grounding material to create a persona to know what their life was like. As, as Paul said, go, go meet them. When you go in with into these communities with Project M, is that the first thing you create, or yeah? And is there something that can pull out that can be used more commonly in in our design and business classes, for instance, or you know programs around the country to know these people? Better. Yeah, so there are two parts of that I think that you know, I, I want to address. One is um, this idea of helicopter, you know, yeah. people helicoptering into a community, you know, thinking they can solve the problems and then they leave and maybe they do something, maybe it's a shit storm. Um, the way I think about <laughs> it is in a lot of these communities, nobody else is doing anything, right? So yes, maybe they're from away and they're helicoptering in, but they're, they're passionate, authentic people trying to do something, and, and who knows what can come from that. So that's kind of my take on that. But we do do something where we're very conscious and sensitive, especially we've learned lessons, so we're better at it. 
where when we go into a community, we do something called 10 by 10 by 10. So first day, almost the first morning, you go out, meet 10 people, 10 locations, come back with 10 stories, and they're shared, right? So that's kind of this, this immersive kind of blitz thing that starts to push people out, having like real conversations with real people um, versus whatever you have in your mind going, you know, when you fly in. Well, there's nothing like that contact. Yeah. You, know, you, can't, you can't design solutions for people. When, when we have our, you know, this is always coming up in, 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 as an educator, people want to go to Tanzania and Bangladesh as students and do projects, which is great if you have a budget to travel, but there are just as many developing worlds, you know, 200 miles from San Francisco in the valley with migrant farm workers on any Native American reservation. Like, those problems are here too, and we don't always remember that. Right. Yeah. I, I lived in Louisiana for five years, and Charleston, South Carolina, and South Carolina for nine years. And um, especially when I was living in Louisiana, there was people living without running water. That's still true of yeah. today. So, I mean, I, I like the idea of the, you know, kind of where I'm putting my, my bet is on the maker movement, you know, the, on the creative jobs. It can, you know, job creation right here in the United States and how that can be really decentralized. It's kind of these things that you're talking about, you know, um, with the Pi Lab. It's, it's like these, it's the same kind of idea. Yeah, we've really shifted um, our focus at Project M from doing kind of social projects to give people water to um, enterprise. Because almost every place we've looked at, you know, Detroit, East Baltimore, these were places that once had a lot of jobs, manufacturing jobs, and, you know, meaningful work where people did things and they made things and they made a living and all that's gone. So we've sort of focused on the, the economic drivers in these communities and just tried to kind of spark something um, we're doing a project in Alabama now, um, making bicycles out of bamboo and trying to create this little cottage industry there and get bamboo grown at scale. So we've, we've shifted. That, that job thing is huge in, in, in the United States, for sure. And when you go into these communities, and, and there's quite a variety now of communities across lots of cultures, how often are you, you know, greeted as liberators versus xenophobic, who the hell are you? It, it's both. I, it, it, for the most part, people, you know, if you're there, there, there's no profit motive, right? So, so young people are using their creative talents to do something positive, and we're always, it's, every project comes out of a personal relationship. Somebody we meet who has, you know, something interesting that we can engage in. So, it's not like um, we're shaken up the community and, and trying to be disruptive. Um, so I think we've figured, we've had some kind of rough parts over the years. We've kind of dialed it in now. Um, we, yeah, go ahead. The, the one thing I do want to address, I don't know how much time we have. Um, so tomorrow, I don't know yeah. how many have yes. signed up. Of course. So this t-shirt I'm wearing right now is a new firm I created um, with my partner, Greg Galley two years ago because we were running a traditional brand design firm here in San Francisco and we got together and said, how come you know, Project M is the most fun, most interesting, um, meaningful thing we do? And then we have all these client things, right? So we said, well, let's just take Project M Pro. So what we've done in future is take the learning from Project M and now we're applying it to, to um, bigger professional um, engagements. And so what we're going to be doing tomorrow is going to run uh, as many people as want to through that future blitz process. And um, I'll talk about it more in the morning, but there, um, be bold. You know, what's the big bold challenge that you want to, uh, Steve Jobs calls it the dent in the universe. First, right. So set the challenge really high. Get out. That's the 10 by 10 by 10. Um, think wrong. We're going to be doing the think wrong um, uh, exercise that will give you a taste for how that works. Um, make stuff. We're actually going to be making some things. Um, bet small how you can 
make these into a portfolio of small bets to get sort of things rolling, and then there's a piece called Fast Forward, how you keep that cycle going. So that, I just wanted to mention yeah. that's what we'll do. Well, and if anyone's interested in that, go to the registration desk at the next break, which is coming up soon, and see if there's room, if, if you're not already in it, uh, because it is going to be a really energetic day. And you'll also get a window into what John does, you know, and why he's up on stage, yeah. because you'll get to participate. It's a mini project, Dan, and I really applaud Compost Modern, because there's this, always at conferences, there's this phenomenon of getting tedded up, right? So you, you see speakers, you know, you're like, oh, you know, what can I do, what can I do? And this is really an attempt to shift from the energy going this way to the energy, you know, coming out. And it's, it's going to be a very engaging process um, that will yield something. So there is a deliverable at the end of the day. As we well. just don't know what that deliverable is. That's and right. that's the exciting. That is exciting. So well, again, we have to move on, which is always the, sort of the curse of this. But I want to thank you for doing what you're doing and all, all these great projects, but also for showing us that we can do it too. That like there's a, a path for us to have as much fun as you. Great. Thank okay. you.